Greetings of the day to all the viewers of IEN Talk Show. I'm Dr. Astha Takkar Kapila, and I'm an Associate Professor of Neurology in PGI Chandigarh. So when I was told that I had to interview Professor Soni by our revered IEN President, Dr. Nirmal Surya, I was thrilled. I felt thrilled. I felt honored. And I felt so meager in the sight of the magnanimous accomplishments of whom, though I had not physically met, but had been inspired to the core. While I felt inspired by the tales of his wisdom and hard work, which resonated the dots of neurology during my PG training in PGI, I felt hesitant of how a neurologist of his stature would respond to my limited experience, to my limited knowledge when I converse with him. And his modesty and humility further touched me. When on our first acquaintance, he told me, Astha, I want this interview to be about the lessons I have learned. I want the next gen of neurologist to learn from my life's journey. This should not be of, I mean, the, the interview should not be about me. It should be, it should be about those lessons. So his optimism and his positivity is contagious. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, our today's guest is Professor IMS Soni, Clinical Director of Neurosciences, SB University Health Board, and Honorary Professor of Neurology Swansea University. Professor Sony is an immaculate medical writer, a world-renowned neurologist, and a benevolent human being. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much, Asta. In the first place, I'm grateful to Indian Academy of Neurology for this opportunity and all your hard work to research my life. And I'm also very grateful to the technical team, Mansi and her colleagues, to making it happen over a weekend. So uh, thank you, sir, and very well welcome. So before we move further, sir, I would request you to tell us about your initial life journey. I was born to a devout Sikh family my father was an agricultural scientist. I have uh, three sibs and I'm the eldest. The other two are quite highly educated. My sister retired as a professor from Agriculture University. My younger brother has a PhD in immunology and working as an high official with Canadian government. So, all the, all three of us had the best education. And this was possible because of the dream of my mother. She was a homemaker. Unfortunately, she could not go for her education because of the circumstances, partition of India. And she fulfilled that dream in her children. I think I'm really grateful to my parents to do their best for my education. My early schooling was in Ludhiana and then my father got transferred to Hisar in Haryana in Agriculture University there. And I may mention that uh, this was a milestone in my learning. I was put in a Hindi medium school where I was never very proficient in Hindi. You know, Punjabi is my first language, being my mother tongue. I was in English medium school and suddenly I was put in a Hindi medium school, which was a very big challenge. But they say, if you get a lemon, make a lemonade out of that. The good outcome was that I became trilingual. Now there are two very basic skills which I learned in this school and they have been handy later on in life. The first, keep your aims high. We had a maths teacher and every maths teacher warned that all his good students should be getting 100%. No, he did not prepare us for 100%. He prepared us for 120%. We used to have 
you know, in a maths paper, 12 questions, and we are supposed to attempt 10 out of 12, the aim which was kept for us was, we will attempt all the 12 and all 12 should be right. And there was no doubt, many of us had 100%. The second was I had my first conscious lesson of creative thinking from him. I do remember he taught us the theorem of Pythagoras and gave an exercise to do at home. I spent two hours on that, struggling with that and could not get with the answer. And so was the situation with most of my other classmates. Next morning, we told him, sir, it is very difficult. You tell us what is the answer. He said, no, 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 go back today and try it again. I protested. I said, sir, this is a waste of time. I wasted two hours and didn't get anything out of it. So he told me a story. He said, son, there was a man and he employed a carpenter to do some woodwork at his place. So at, uh, the carpenter worked for three, four hours and then he started you know, sharpening his uh, tools. The man became very cross with him. He said, look, I paid you for doing the work, not sharpening the tools. You are wasting time. The poor carpenter kept working with the blunt tools and the outcome was in the next half of the day, output was 50%, what he achieved during the day. So he said, look, this is sharpening your brain. This is not waste of time. And no doubt, lo and behold, next day, I got the right answer for that. And I have kept that throughout my life. And I think the only other thing over the years which I have added, that if I have a very difficult problem, patient related, science related, administrative, I think and sleep over it. I let my subconscious work on it during the sleep. And most of the time I have the right answer when I get up in the morning. From there on, the next stage was shifting to the medical school. My pre-university, pre-medical was from Hisar only, DN College. I applied for three medical schools, Government College Amritsar. I got on the basis of my merit. I applied to All India Institute. That time there used to be a written exam and interview. I could not make it. I applied to CMC Ludhiana. Again, there was a written exam and interview and uh, I was selected and uh, Ultimately, it was decided that I will go to CMC Ludhiana. And this is from where the next bit of the journey, which is a medical journey, which starts. That was great, sir. I, that is exactly what I was talking about. The optimism in your words is contagious. So uh, I am just sharing this picture over here. I hope it's visible to everyone, yeah. So this was, we all know that you uh, trained in neurology from PGI. So what about this med school journey, sir? And before you tell us, uh, I would really want to mention one small thing that Professor Kapil Sethi actually told me to specifically ask you, what about the gang of friends and what do you remember of that? He also mentioned that almost all your friends during med school definitely believed that you were the most studious, the most upright and the most virtuous students they ever knew and you would never uh, get involved in any outrage, come what may. So what do you remember about those times, sir? Thank you, Vasta. Your last question first. I think my father was responsible for that kind of a behavior and character. When I entered the medical school, he called me. He said, look, son, I'm not a millionaire who's going to leave a big inheritance for you. I will give you, or I will try my best to give you the, you know, a very good education. 
I can only provide you with the opportunity. It is up to you, utilize or no. But my dream is that I make you capable of creating a fortune rather than me leaving you a fortune. I followed that advice throughout. So I think I was very focused that time, you know, that I need to do medicine, I need to do it properly. Those were the golden days. And uh, it was, you know, really great to be in CMC. One good thing was that we were only 50 students. So it was a very small class and we are still very close to each other. And out of that, we had a core group, Kapil Sethi, Vinod Bandari, who are in USA now, a very dear friend, Ashok Chabra, we lost him. Raj Vimal, he's in Chandigarh. And there were some other very great pals, uh, Amar Bhalla, Afzal in Chandigarh, uh, sorry, in Ludhiana. But I think I, I'm, I was close to many of them. And uh, when I look back and reflect, you know, what best I got out of uh, medical school, there were two, three things. One, it is a compassion and empathy. The reason for that was most of my teachers were missionaries. So it, it was in them and we vibe, you know, from them. Second, it was a very good uh, foundation for clinical uh, workup. And uh, I think out of all the things which struck me that every doctor should have a very good sense of observation. And it was very interesting. My first class, you know, in the third year when they start teaching you clinical examination, it was Betty Cummon, a Scottish lady was professor of medicine. And he took the, you know, small batch he was teaching, showed us 25 patients in the ward. And there was only a single question we had to answer. Does the patient sick look, uh, does the patient look good or does the patient look sick? And I think that's a very big lesson. If you can realize that your patient is very sick, if you can't do anything, then immediately ask for uh, help. But I think later on, though you try to keep on developing it, uh, something which has struck me, this is another small uh, anecdote. By the time I graduated and uh, I was working as a house officer in medicine during my MD training, uh, we admitted a patient who had a pleural effusion, tapped it, it looked like it is tuberculous, put on anti-tubercular therapy. Within three months, repeat x-ray showed significant improvement, very little effusion. Six months later, I saw him in the outpatient. And when I examined, I thought that the, there's a dullness in the base. Repeated a chest x-ray and the fusion had come back. And I could not put my head around why the fusion should come back on treatment. So asked the consultant with whom I was working. He said, yes, this is very serious. You admit the patient, do the tap again. Maybe we didn't get the diagnosis right. We admitted that. Same afternoon, put a needle twice. It was a dry tap. Asked my registrar. She tried, did not get it. Next morning, the patient was presented on the grand round. There were two professors registrars, house officers, it is a big team. There must be about 10 people there. They had to look at the x-rays. Nobody could answer that. They said, looks like that the, this effusion is uh, loculated. So go to the cardiothoracic surgeons and tell them to do it under x-ray guided, uh, do an x-ray guided tap. I took those x-rays 
and we had a professor of cardiothoracic surgery, C.M. Singh, put on the first X-ray. Yes, there is a big pleural effusion. Second, it is almost gone. Third one, it has come back again. So he told me, he says, in the morning, will you put the first X-ray again? I put it back. He looked at me. He says, the last X-ray doesn't belong to this patient. <laughs> I said, sir, the name is same. The central registration number is same. He says, to help with that. The clavicles are different. Can't you see that? That was the sense of observation. And when we read that, there was a six digit central registration number and one digit was different and it was a wrong X-ray. It, it was misfiled. And that was the sense of observation. And then I decided, look, this is something which is very valuable. And I, you know, try to improve upon that. And this is one of the lessons for the junior colleagues that if you want to be a good neurologist, you should be like a Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> good observation and good analysis. These are the key to that. Yeah. And uh, I think after that, my, uh, after graduation, my MD medicine is from there only. And then I went on to do neurology later. Why, why, why neurology, sir? Why not something else? That's also a very, very interesting, partly circumstantial. I was very impressed during graduation even, we had a professor of neurosurgery in Abhudri Path. He gave a lecture on uh, brain tumors. I think it is not the brain tumors which interested me. That man was really bright and a very, very good teacher. And it struck me, you know, that time, maybe I do neurology. Later on, I had a chance to work with him during my internship. So I, there was somewhere in my mind, yes, the neurology is something which I can do it later. But something very interesting uh, happened when we were preparing for our uh, MD medicine exam. One of the professors of medicine, he came to my room and he said, uh, look, we had a meeting yesterday and CMC has decided that they are going to develop now cardiology, neurology, and nephrology, three subspecialities. Those days, you know, they were not separate subspe uh, subspecialities in uh, CMC. And uh, we feel that you can be one of the candidates. We can uh, send you to Velour for some training and you come back and work with us. I was on the moon. What more do you want? You know, they are offering you a job. They will sponsor you. They will get you DM. And uh, so I said, sir, either I can do cardiology or I can do neurology. We said, we, we feel that you are fit for cardiology. You should be doing cardiology. I said, fair enough. I will go for that. And uh, later on, Something else happened, which probably there's no point in discussing it in public, <laughs> that uh, that plan was stalled for some time. There were, there were reasons, administrative reasons in the department. And uh, I probably overreacted to that and uh, felt that this was not right. And I decided then, okay, the next opportunity I get to get trained somewhere else, you know, I, I, I will go. So I thought of applying a couple of places. And uh, that year, there was no place in neurology or cardiology in Chandigarh. I was told endocrinology where I can easily get in, which I didn't want to do. I applied in Delhi in uh, Delhi University, GB Panth. There was a combined written exam for neurology and cardiology. That institute that time had, I think, three subspecialities. 
So when I cleared the written exam, I went for the neurology interview. The usual questions were asked and I was told, okay, you will get a letter from the university, whether you make it or not. Same afternoon, there was a cardiology interview. So I went for cardiology interview also. Now, all the members in the panel, they were different, but the dean was the same. So he, he looked at me, he says, uh, look, young man, you came in the morning for neurology. I said, yes, sir. He says, you can't. So what is happening now? You come for cardiology now. Can you tell me what do you want? You want neurology or you want cardiology? That was a very, very difficult situation for me. I didn't know what was happening. I said, sir, I'm torn between the two. So he jokingly said, he said, look, the only solution is have one as a wife and other as a mistress. <laughs> then he told me, look, we have already selected you for neurology. If you say it is good for you, we are not interviewing you for cardiology. If you say you don't want neurology, then I take you off and I interview you for cardiology. I said, no, no, I'm happy with neurology. And this is how, you know, the destiny turned me from cardiology to neurology then. <laughs> and the uh, rest is the history then. True, sir. True, sir. So at this moment, I'm going to share another uh, picture with you, everybody else as well. So, sir, we all know that uh, you were one of the choicest associates of Professor J.S. Chopra. And uh, as uh, the other day you were mentioning to me, training of horses by Professor Chopra, I would want you to just elaborate on that aspect of your life as well. In uh, PGI Chandigarh, and even later on, uh, he has been my mentor. Great respect for him very dynamic and inspirational personality. If you tell me to sum it up, he was like a live wire. Anybody comes, will get inspired. If you go too near, then you can get a 10,000 volt jolt also. <laughs> <laughs> and he, I, I the, uh, the, Several other things I learned from him, very fond of, uh, you know, publishing. And his motto was publish or perish. So, you know, that is another thing which inculcated and most of my publications were. And when I was in uh, Chandigarh or writing books, he was, uh, he was a man with a golden heart, very helpful for his students. But from outside, there were times the training was very harsh. Maybe that was the need of the day because we used to have a two year course and completing everything in uh, two years was not difficult. It was a very, you know, sometimes going hard, harsh and stressful training. And I, I do remember, you know, my contemporary Professor Madhusudan, who's in Kerala now, both of us were uh, appearing for the DM exam together. Shok Pangadia, whom we unfortunately lost, it a very dear friend. He was six months senior to us. So this was the trio which was together in PGI at that time. And uh, he, in between the rounds, we were sitting you know, the usual story is around the coffee table there. And he said something. Professor Vijaykart was sitting there and he said, Jagjit, look, these boys are going to appear in two weeks time in exam. So why, why are you so, so harsh now? So I think that day we realized, you know, what was the reason behind that? He said, look, they are my children. I want them first class Arabian horses so that they can do neurology anywhere in the world. And if I am lenient to them, they will turn out to be mules. I don't want that. And 
I think the outcome is if you have a look at that, his students, they are holding very high positions throughout the world. And, and no, no doubt he trained first class Arabian uh, horses. But that's, that was his way of uh, doing the thing. Doing the thing. Yes, sir. Uh, for another, moving on. So we have another one over here. So this was your family beyond family, I'm sure, because your students know, professors themselves, of course. So I had a word with a couple of them, Professor Lal, Professor Kaul, Professor Gagandi, and who uh, go on to say that you are actually a bridge between the residents and Professor Chopra. Uh, Dr. Call was like discreetly remembering the time when you, uh, in reality, encouraged him to go and interact with Professor Chopra first time in the ward rounds after joining after a, a long haul. So, what was your experience with your students as young faculty, sir? And what is it like now when you meet them uh, so accomplished themselves? They are so accomplished in their own ways. You can call them my students, but if you look at that, you know, I, I, I just finished my training and uh, I was lucky enough to get a faculty position. So if you see the age difference, that was not very great with some of my students. In fact, some of my students were even older than me later on who came as in-service candidates. Yes. So I, I was very close to them. And being on the faculty, and at that time, Professor Chopra was very fond of, uh, you know, publishing, and I was very active on that. He, he, he you know, he, he liked me, there's no doubt about it. And uh, I think it is a little bit of a hesitation for some of the students when you hear the old stories of PGI training and uh, some of the people getting even in China after the war drowned and uh, <laughs> <leaving> neurology. <laughs> but uh, to be honest, uh, when you tell them what the ground reality is, that everyone loves them, that is uh, helpful. So uh, they, uh, I'm sure they also realize and they have the same feeling and they, they also love the training what they have. Now, it is, it is great, you know, they're becoming professors and uh, heading the big institutes. And when I see several of them, you know, they have been uh, presidents of Indian Academy of Neurology and, uh, you know, Call is one of them, Chandrasekhar is one of them, Kagandeep is one of them. Lal is doing very well, heading the PGI department now, neurology, and very soon will be heading the neurology center, which we were dreaming and conceiving at that time, but which is going to happen now. Asa, you know, what is the greatest moment of joy for a teacher? When he sees students that his students have excelled him mm. and they have done that. So uh, I, I'm really proud of them. And that's a joy when I see that they're doing better than me. That's amazing, sir. And uh, before I move on from this uh, aspect of yours, so do you know about uh, the silent treatment theory which was going on when you were in the wards of neurology. So uh, uh, I talked to uh, Professor Khurana and he was telling me that you were known for the silent treatment. So whenever there was a disagreement with the resident or whatever thing it was, you would not uh, get outraged or get angry. Rather, it would be a silent treatment and everybody would understand. They would know what to speak and when not to speak. <laughs> so do you remember that, sir? I, I think the people around me knew that trait better than me. <laughs> the other day, my wife was telling them, uh, telling me, you know, the in PGI, we were working so hard. We were working uh, six and a half days in a week. Saturday was a working day. Sunday morning, you are on call, you are not on call. 
I will be there in the library. You know, those were the days when you have to do any everything with the index medicus. We didn't have the computers and, uh, you know, PubMed and stuff like that. You had to do everything uh, manually, either coming to the wardroom to teach or uh, sit in the library to catch up with the journals and other things. So probably there was a half a day. And this used to be sometimes in the morning, they wanted me to at home and I wanted to go to the library. And uh, she said, oh, you won't say anything, but your mood will be so off that ultimately I will think it is better off. At least you go there, you spend few hours and come back with a good mood rather than rather than being silent. So I think probably I have that trait. And maybe when the people who are very near and dear to me, I think that time when they do something which makes me upset, I feel the fault is mine, not theirs. Why didn't we train them better that they could answer that? So I don't think it is their fault. Okay, sir. The fault is with me. No, 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 not at all, sir. So on this note only, sir, you mentioned the PGI library. So uh, while I was uh, speaking to your daughter, Dr. Vinny, she told me how you would prepare uh, uh, very uh, dedicatedly for all these CPCs and staff clinicals, which are till date remembered and acclaimed by many of your students and your colleagues. So uh, that, that must have been a great time in PJ, sir. Uh, it, 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 it became uh, one of the very good things which I, you know, the PGI has taught me so many things. And as a neurologist, what I am today, most of the credit goes to PGI for that. And I openly say that this kind of a training you will never get anywhere else. Brilliant training. And one of the skills which I picked up from there is the a good history taking and analysis. Analysis of the history, analysis of the case, and the history analysis used to be so good that the dictum is by the time you put your patient on the couch for examination, if you do not have a diagnosis, you are not a first class neurologist. 80% of your diagnosis comes from the history. Only thing is you have to be good at taking it and then you have to be good at analyzing it. And that analysis I learned from there and that analytical skill was very handy for CPCs. And it, it used to be a fun, it was a mental game. So I think there was, uh, in the later part of my career, it became almost a dictum. If I happen to be there, whether I like it or don't like it, whether I it was my case or not, I had to give a comment on uh, neurology and I, I, I really realized that, I, I really enjoyed that. And uh, I think that analytical skill, which I have uh, learned from there, in fact, you can extrapolate many of these skills to other areas. And I find that very useful even now, not for even cases, uh, you know, your uh, patients and the case analysis. I do a bit of a medical legal work also. And for those reports, analyzing the case, coming to the core point where the things have gone wrong, you know, it is, it is highly appreciated, uh, you know, in, in that field also. So this is another, you know, good skill, which PGI gave me. So let's move over to another of your uh, photographs, sir. Sir, this you must be remembering definitely your immense contribution towards World Congress of Neurology. It is, a, it, it, it is a really memorable year, 89. For two years, we worked very hard. And I will say probably one year of uh, life was completely dedicated to World Congress of Neurology. I was the assistant secretary at that time. On the left-hand side, we have a photo with Lord Walton, who was that time president of the World Federation of Neurology. And we had a very long association with him since then. You know, he wrote the foreword 
for uh, our book on neurology and tropics, even the second edition, they did that. On the right hand side, you can see that uh, some of the very good friends, those who were, you know, registrars at that time, along with uh, Professor Noshir Wadia, very well respected neurologist. These are the people who started neurology in India. So it was a great experience on uh, several aspects. When we were preparing for that, you know, I was very naive as far as computers were concerned. They had just come, but I think some proficiency because when we're working on the scientific program, the skills which I picked up from there, then the organization, that was another thing. And this, this, was a, this was an opportunity to interact with uh, some of the big wigs in neurology at that time. And uh, some of the associations have been uh, very strong and uh, carried on from uh, there. And uh, I'm happy to say that it was a very, very big success. You know, the contract wasn't given to a company to organize. It is the all the local team who did it and everyone had his contribution. And of course, Professor Chopra was at the helm of the affairs. And uh, many times we were going home eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night, uh, working since morning on this beautiful days. Yes, sir. I'll just take from here, sir. These are another ones. These are a few of the photographs of the annual conference of the IEA and the third one. So I think you were very immensely involved in uh, IENCON this year as well. I, I think the year is 1995, right? Yes, uh, yes I, 1995, yes, I was actively involved in that time. And uh, yes, these are the 1995. And uh, there are, uh, I think, a couple of, awards giving and stuff like that, uh, which is going on. And it is, you know, yes, that brings very vivid old memories, seeing the colleagues there and uh, some of them are uh, still around. I think uh, those were the days uh, we were working hard and uh, I, I have very, fond memories of that when you go down the memory lane at that time. Yes. So we have more of them, sir. There are more from the INCON 1995. Yeah. Lower down, I can see, you know, that is uh, Professor Srinivasan on the extreme right, and uh, David, he was professor of neurology at King's when I did a Commonwealth Fellowship. I worked with him, very good orator, a man with lots of common sense. And uh, I, I learned quite a bit from uh, uh, Kim. And in between what you see is some of the present faculty there. Uh, thank you very much for bringing them, yes. So I move on to this uh, picture over here, sir. You were awarded the Commonwealth Fellowship for training in epilepsy in Maudsley and King's College Hospital, London. These must definitely be, there must be many thoughts and memories attached to it. And at the same time, I would like to uh, ask you, sir, uh, was this the time when you really got interested into epilepsy? I mean, I, I know that there's a lot of work done by you in epilepsy, sir. Uh, I, uh, that's another story, how I got interested into epilepsy. No, I got interested into epilepsy much before that. And, uh, I think the interest came that one day, you must be knowing him, he retired now, Professor Subhash Verma. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He used to organize MD lectures. So he came to me and uh, he said, uh, will you give a lecture on epilepsy? And by that time, I, I you know, didn't have any special interest in epilepsy. I said, Okay, I will. So I thought I will make it interactive. And uh, I put out 10 very 
important questions and interacted with the residents, basically, you know, telling them some of the facts about uh, epilepsy and how to manage it. And I worked hard to prepare that. And uh, it was so much liked and so many compliments I had that I do remember many years later, I went for a DM exam in uh, Calcutta. And uh, we, we had a you know, very dear friend, Shyamal Das, who was a senior resident at that time, later professor there. So he brought a copy of those cards. He said, sir, do you remember that? I have still kept them. They are so informative. So I think that was a triggering point, uh, which slowly I had an interest in epilepsy. I wanted to start an epilepsy clinic. And uh, when an opportunity came for a higher training, so I opted to go to Maudsley, who was very good at that time. And I wanted to learn more about uh, EEG and uh, Colin Binney, he was the neurophysiologist where I had the you know, longest association with him. Nigel Lee, uh, you know, these are the people I, I worked with. And uh, the photographs you showed, I think that was my farewell. I spent a year with them. Now, I learned a lot about the EEG in neurophysiology but something more which I, I, I learned that was great. When we were there, so I told Colin Binney, I said, look, I will, you know, write to, like to publish something, write something. He said, all right, we have done uh, some patients with uh, multiple, uh, uh, you know, subpile transactions. Why don't you review them and we can write it up. So I think there were two patients, they were done two or three in my presence, but rest were old cases. So I pulled them up and we produced the paper. Uh, so when the paper was almost ready, so I went to him, I said to Colin, it's almost ready. Will you like to have a look at the draft and tell me who should be the first author? He looked at me. He said, Dr. Sunny, of course you. I said, uh, look, Colin, I, my contribution is only reviewing it. I haven't done any of the multiple subpile transactions myself. These are your cases. He said, of course. When it will be published, everyone will know Dr. Sunny doesn't do <laughs> multiple subpile transactions. It is Colin who's responsible for that. And I think this is a something he said, which uh, uh, this is a kind of a humble message to some of the seniors in neurology, not the juniors. It was very touching what he said. He said, look in your life, it is only the first 10 or 20 papers which are important. So by the time you got a consultant job, you have already become a professor. How does it make a difference whether you have 100 publications or you have got 50 publications? Right, sir. Yes, if you have done something great, it is a seminal paper that makes a difference. And if you have done it, it is your. But supposing if you are telling your fellow or registrar to do something and then you are putting your name there, I don't think it pays anything. So... I think this is sometimes I see that the, you know, the juniors have worked hard and the seniors are putting their name there. I don't think it pays in the long run. That was a very good learning for me. In fact, from there on, I didn't do it to my juniors then. <laughs> I, I knew I, I don't need more papers for my career progression. <laughs> right, sir. So, so you, you served as the program director of Wales. So tell us something about your overseas journey. What was it like when you were handed this enormous responsibility, sir? To be honest, to, to, in the first place, how I left PGI and went over there, that looks like to me a destiny. There was nothing planned. I was quite happy in PGI, uh, you know, very satisfying academically 
financially, me and my wife both were, uh, you know, on the faculty. You get good money to live nicely, and the PGI gives you big bungalows. So the page used to be very small. We didn't have any saving at all. We didn't have anything in the bank. Uh, one evening I came home and I had a phone call from Swansea. And uh, I didn't know this gentleman. And he said, uh, Professor Sony, this is Richard Weiser. Will you like to come and work with us? I said, sir, it looks like you are mistaken. You are calling the wrong person. He said, why? I said, look, I don't have any British qualifications. My only experience is I did a Commonwealth Fellowship, some training there. And uh, I have uh, not much experience and you are asking me to come and work with you. Don't worry, everything will be taken care of. I was a little nonplussed and uh, you know, I asked Harjeet, my wife, she said, oh, if they're offering you everything on the plate, what is the harm in trying that? So after you know, some deliberations, I thought, okay, I will take two years you know, sabbatical leave from PGI, which I was allowed, go and work there and see how does it go. And I may come back after two years. So when I went for the interview, that is another coincidence. There was a, what I was told later, there was a quite a hot discussion prior to the interview that one of the very senior members on the panel wasn't keen to take me on. And he, he said, why, why you need to get somebody from abroad when you have your own people available here, which is very, very legitimate. I, I, I respect that. But I think after the interview, when he saw me, he took a 180 degree turn because he had met me during the World Congress. He says, oh, if this is the chap, yes, we want him. After the interview, they said, okay, we are offering you a job. I said, what you do, you give me a you know, locum job, that means you give me a job only for a year, two years. And if I like you, you like me, we will continue. Answer was no, we are offering you a substantive post, which is a permanent. If you don't like it, you give us three months notice and leave it. So I, you know, I thought it is okay. I joined and uh, the love and affection I had from there was really great. From the, you know, my colleagues there, from the patients, and uh, I was still plus minus at the end of uh, two years. Should I stay back or should I come back? But I think ultimately the the circumstances were so I was pushed more towards staying in Swansea rather than coming back to uh, PGI. And then the rest is a history. Coming to, you know, Swansea, my major job had been a consultant neurologist. That is the bread and butter. That the service you see the patients. Then a honorary professor to the Swansea University involved with uh, you know, research and other things with them. And I have some very, very good colleagues in that area. Uh, then it was training the students, which from my PGI days, I enjoyed that. We made some changes in the training program, organized some more academic sessions and conferences, which we used to call CNS, Cardiff, Newport, Swansea, these are the three major uh, centers there. Those meetings were a success. Then I took over as a clinical director for uh, neurosciences. I think the role kept on changing. This was more organizational and uh, organized neurology and uh, develop it in the Southwest Wales. So there are a number of new projects 
you know, they were brought in. When I joined, we were only, you know, three consultants there. We are a very big family now. We are 11 or 12 now. There's some in the pipeline. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful part of the world. And uh, I have great, great colleagues, always very supportive. I think this is uh, one of the things which uh, let me carry on uh, here that uh, the atmosphere in the department is so good. There are very few departments where so many people can sit together and talk to each other. No, they're very nice people and great support from Chris Ricards is one of the senior ones always supported me. He was six months senior to me when I joined. Uh, you know, Rob Powell, there are many in the team. They're, they're very, very good. And patients also, they're very, very good. I, I think it has been a very, very satisfying and good experience. It, it's good. It's more than 20 years I have spent here now. Yes, sir. On this note, sir, uh, just sharing this uh, image with uh, all of you. So this is the present epilepsy team, sir. In this is my, this is our present epilepsy team. And uh, uh, if you start from, uh, you know, the one end, the man in the red shirt, he's Luke, he's our coordinator, very efficient, keeps our waiting list down. Next to that is uh, Tracy, she's a secretary to Rob Powell, very good lady. Next to that, the young man is Professor uh, Owen Pickrell, and uh, he, he works half the time with the Swansea University, and uh, he has a great knowledge of genetics, epidemiology. We got very powerful computer there, so he is right now publishing the most, uh, you know, paper after paper in a year on these aspects. Next to that is uh, Sharon, who's the epilepsy nurse. And then it is myself. Next to me is Helen. She's my secretary. Remarkable lady. To the extent uh, she's so efficient that she can do a mind reading now. Before I tell her to do anything, what I'm thinking, she knows what I'm thinking. And, and that will be done. And then it is Rob Powell. Like he, he has a doctorate in uh, imaging and epilepsy. Uh, very, very intelligent and uh, proficient epileptologist. And then it is Jenny, who's the epilepsy nurse. These epilepsy nurses are like gold for us. You know, they have, they are our ears and uh, eyes. We don't see too many patients ourselves now. They will see the patients, discuss with us, and they brought down our waiting list to nil now. It's, it's a very, very excellent team. And, uh, you know, it's like a family. We, we work very well together. I'll just take it from here. So these are some random selection of the times you were in India, sir. So while we are talking about your journey abroad and in India, so what's the most remarkable or what's the most uh, striking difference between the training in India, training in training overseas, academic research in India overseas, things like that? I, the things are different. And the reason for that is your circumstances. You know, if you talk about the training, the emphasis, I'm talking about PGI, or the kind of institutes I have been, the emphasis has been on training more than evaluation. You know, you are, especially in PGI, there were so many teaching opportunities. And uh, then at the end of the day, when you go for the exams, even if you are borderline, if you have worked very well throughout the training period and everyone is happy. So you are, you know, a minor mistake will be ignored and you will be through. 
uh, in the West here, the emphasis is more on evaluation, not on training. Training is mostly left on you. You are responsible for that. Yes, opportunities are created, but uh, you do the things yourself. For example, you know what is equivalent to MD here, that is MRCP. There's a standard exam. Even if you are lacking by half a mark, you are failed. So, you know, th that kind of a difference is uh, there. Research again, uh, the basic science research is more powerful in the West. Probably you need, uh, you know, more resources and all which are available compared to though the big institutes like NIMHANS, PGI, you know, they have set up for basic research, but if you go to an ordinary medical college, what you can mostly, you know, do there is a clinical bit, not the other things. But then there are advantages in India. If you want to recruit somebody for a drug trial or anything, you know, what you achieve in a year, in the West, you can achieve the same things in a month or two there in India, the numbers are so. So I think every place has its own, uh, you know, uh, plus points and uh, lows. Uh, but uh, ultimately, I think uh, looking at PGI, the way, you know, the publications come out, the work is done, people are doing excellent work uh, there. Uh, so your interaction and help to not just the academic, but even the non-academic staff in PJ has been highly appreciated and talked about. So your impeccable sense of duty is worth learning and it was heartwarming when your students and children were talking alike about your selfless service to society. I'm just sharing another uh, picture over here with you, sir. So I'm sure you must be remembering these ones. So these are from the hidden treasures of Professor Vivek Lal who has always <laughs> talked about you very, very fondly, sir. You must definitely be remembering these and I, I would want you to tell us more about these letters. There was, they were around hundred photo, hundreds of these letters when he opened his, I would say the Pitara or the Khizana, which he had uh, some hollow fight with, which, ha which he has with him for such a long time. I, 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 I didn't expect him to keep that. Uh, he himself is a very good soul and, uh, you know, looking after the patients and then also without saying anything. I think in one of my trips when I was here, uh, when I came down to PGI, I, I saw that, uh, you know, there are patients. This is one of, again, the major difference between the West and all. I don't have to worry anything about the uh, expenses when somebody is admitted under me. Everything is paid by NHS, but uh, even though PGI, they are not charging anything extra. You have to pay for your medication. And I saw that they are struggling with that. And uh, it was always on my mind that when, uh, you know, God has given you enough, there should be some contribution to society. Either it is going for a education. Sometimes me and my wife decided that uh, maybe set aside some money for educating. And we also had the emphasis that if the preference is, it should be a girl child rather than a male, because he will look after so many families then. And later on when I saw, I think for a couple of years, I saw that, you know, his funds were running, running low, but he's doing so good work. So whatsoever I could contribute to that, I was doing it for some time. So no, that that is one quality which is worth appreciating with Vivek, that uh, you know his empathy for the patients and uh, silently working on these things and helping the patients. It is it is highly appreciated. Sir, sir, uh, sir, I'll take you to, to the next photograph from here. So yes, this is your better half, Professor Harjit Soni. Her close friends, specifically to mention Dr. Praveen Mahajan, Dr. Savita, 
they discreetly remember how both of you are so similar in traits i am sure that uh, she is the basic anchor and the pillar of strength for yourself and your family absolutely and absolutely she she is not a better half she is a three quarter half <laughs> she is three quarter i think uh, she is an embodiment of service and sacrifice you know what she has done in her life and uh, what she has done for me and the family i totally agree with you we, we are nothing you know without her a, a great sport and uh, what you see in the picture is my eldest uh, uh, grandson puru very very intelligent uh, boy you know sometimes that kind of a questions he will ask and i i i get uh, so 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 your daughters are themselves very well accomplished and they are doing amazingly well in their respective fields so i, I remember while talking to dr vinith she told me one amazing thing how you trained them to keep the fluctuations in their life and fluctuations in their emotions to the minimum so i think that was one one thing which amazed me even i mean like thought and uh, the following are uh, the pictures of uh, their children so i'm certain these moments would be the most cherished moments for you as well sir so absolutely i have uh, two daughters both are very intelligent hard working uh when it is the eldest and uh, she did her uh, mbbs from afmc but now her cardiology training here she is an interventional cardiologist does uh electrocardiophysiology and uh, she is in london and the younger one you know when we came here she moved with us so she had her schooling here she went to cambridge to do her uh, medicine and she is a consultant now in uh, general medicine and nephrology in uh, reading and uh, what you see here is my elder grandson puru and we are on a walking trail this is one of the best walking trails in swansea on the background you see the you know that is the sea that the blue thing below the sky and uh, on the right hand side which you can't see are the hills it's it's a beautiful walk when you whenever we get time we go there the other one is i think when he was only one year old his first christmas so that is at uh, com very very fond memories and i have two very intelligent uh, you know uh, sons in law rishi and uh, simon rishi is a nephrologist again in london simon is a interventional radiologist in in london only so basically i think it is a family of doctors now <laughs> <laughs> right sir so uh, these are another these are few more pictures of your sir and uh, i i'll take you to the uh, this this picture this is one of uh, one of the ones which i really like the most so the mentions of your family about your tidily and neatly maintained bookshelves and neatly kept books and your skillful handwriting and your selection of pens i mean i'm sure these depict your disciplined systematic focused life that you lead and you've maintained all throughout sir i think it reflects many things uh it is in the older generation to which i belong handwriting used to be a big issue so there was a training right from the beginning right well and uh, to be honest i i i don't use uh, ball points i only use fountain pens and that shows my weakness also generally i will keep within my means you know i i don't overspend on anything but one place where i'm extra vagant is buying pens <laughs> and that is fountain pens that is my that is my weakness and you can see the collection there so many of these are collectors items and uh, they're very very 
good fountain. Uh, this is directly uh, from your desk, sir. <laughs> yes, yes, that is uh, that is in my study. Where you are, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, I, I move on to the next slide, sorry, this one. So what are your interests other than medicine? So uh, I mean, I'm asking this because and I put these photographs because I got to know about your passions for yoga, gardening, and specifically, I would want you to mention about your interest in spiritual well-being, in mind, spirit, body, and the death, near death experience, and so on. So there are so many things which I got to know during this period of two weeks when I was Trying to know more about you. Yeah, my. If you talk about, do I play any sports or so? Answer is no. Long walks, yes, by the beach, and what you can see here is uh, both me and uh, my grandson on the Swansea beach, and uh, on the left hand side, you know, he's trying to do some painting. That was his first lesson in painting. <laughs> And I'm sitting by him, and he he did very well. Uh, most of my leisure time, either it is long box, and I like some old Hindi music, and reading. And uh, generally, I do heavy reading. Uh, yes, you are very right. Uh, body, mind, and spirit. Uh, you know. Osho, Sadhguru, Deepak Chopra, Eckhart Tolle, they, they are, you know, generally this kind of a thing I will be reading uh, more and my best relaxing time is on a easy chair, feet up with a good book in uh, hand. So, yes, that's what it is. So this next picture is you in Chandigarh. So sir, you came to Chandigarh for your daughter's wedding and you came to Chandigarh in INCON 2014. How was it like homecoming, coming to Chandigarh after so many years? Any memories you remember? I, 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 I was really touched. And uh, you know, when I came back, this was uh, some of the other, it was decided that she will be getting married in India. So we were trying to say which is the best place. And that is, uh, you know, we decided it is Chandigarh where we know, you know, people around more than anywhere else. And uh, one of the very touching thing was, I was trying to book a hotel or so. So I, you know, spoke to people here, we wait. And, uh, you know, people were very, very very helpful and uh, then suddenly it was realized that the date was coinciding with the dm neurology exam and that i wanted the you know invite the whole department there to attend the marriage and uh, without my saying anything that was very very hard touching uh, you know they, they decided that they will postpone the exam so that they can come and attend the marriage. Uh, PGI gave me another gift, which I am ever thankful to God. And that is a very good friend, Dr. Mathuria. And uh, he's more than a friend to me. He is no longer in PGI. He retired as a head of neurosurgery and uh, he's in Jodhpur now. And when we came here, he was extremely helpful. In fact, uh, my daughter had a dual wedding, a Hindu wedding and a Sikh wedding. And the Hindu wedding was uh, performed by Dr. Mathuria as her own daughter. It was, it was in his house. First was a Hindu wedding and then we went for a Sikh wedding later on uh, this thing. I think it was a very, very touching experience for me seeing the goodness in the people. You know, I thought I haven't been here for 15 years. Who remembers you? What will do? But I think wherever you went, wherever you wanted uh, some help, those who knew me, and uh, they went out of the way to help us. It, it didn't look like that we are not at home. We were definitely at home. Sir, that's 
that was really amazing sir and sir if you could i mean just one question out of the blue that if you would just rewind the time clock what would you want to relive for all these years which have passed by now you have thrown a googly pasta <laughs> sir uh i probably have a little bit of a different perception you know when you go back to your life there are good times and bad times there are success successes and failures but all these are two sides of a coin nobody can have a life which will be one sided everyone is going to get them the success gives you inspiration the failure makes you a better person so both are very very necessary for your development so if you ask me that i will really go back and relive my answer will be little bit different from what most of the people will say i will say for me the most important and enjoyable moment is now when you are interviewing me <laughs> and uh, this is one thing we have to learn the mind it does not live in present either it goes down to the past where you start cribbing what went wrong with you or you may be thinking what were the good days you have or it goes into the future where there are fears what will happen to you or you are daydreaming you know what you want to achieve but i tell you none of that is a reality past is a past that is gone it it will never come back future you don't know so this is the most important moment and those who have learned how to live it they are at peace with uh, themselves so i think i i am living this one i am enjoying this one now so there's wow. definitely so much so much to learn from you but before we finish this talk of today sir what is the one lesson you would want to give to the next gen neurologists sir budding what i will say you know when you come to my age and you say the next generation or a young neurologist one is who are in training my humble plea to them is don't kill your clinical skills with the modern technology and this is the rot which i can see is setting in because you have an access to mri better neuroimaging the clinical skills are dying you know that is an asset and they should never be lost and they are very lucky what they have today which we didn't have but if you combine you know then the results will be exponential and they they they, they should not do that and uh, now for me they are still young but uh, some of them as you said you know like lal gagandeep call you know they are heading the institutes uh, my suggestion will be that if you want to go fast then you go alone but if you want to go far then take everyone along with you and that is one mistake sometimes we do i think this is a real art when you carry the whole department with you and uh, one of the great skills which you have to develop over the years to do that is a active listening most of the time your training is how to talk not to listen but listening has much more power than talking listen to your colleagues listen to even the junior most fellow in your department and many times what they are talking is they are talking sense before you take any decisions you consider that try to take collective decisions then your department will go very very far thank you many 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 thanks for today's very intriguing and very exciting to our sir i'm sure there was a lesson to learn for everyone from today's uh one hour talk show with you i am amazed and i'm humbled today after i've spoken to you 
for an hour. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all of you. God bless you.